The tech industry and India, why Facebook, Apple, Google and Tesla all rolled out the red carpet this weekend for India's prime minister, Narendra Modi. I'm Brendan Greeley. I am not Emily Chang. She is out today. This is Bloomberg West. Coming up, Apple sells a record 13 million of its latest iPhones during the debut weekend. This time, the numbers include China. Plus, let's stay on Apple. CEO Tim Cook and screenwriter Aaron Sorkin declare a truce. Sorkin has a movie. Cook has a company. They had a spat. We're going to walk you through it. And I'm going to sing this. Is there life on Mars? That was not right, but maybe, maybe, maybe. NASA just announced that it's discovered water on Mars. Water is a necessary precursor to life. Product tie-in to upcoming Matt Damon epic coming soon. Now to our lead, India and Silicon Valley. Over the weekend, Narendra Modi, India's prime minister, went on a tour with Silicon Valley's tech elite. At Narendra Modi, tweeted out pictures from meetings with Tesla CEO Elon Musk, Google's executive team, and Apple CEO Tim Cook. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg held a town hall. Zuckerberg wore a tie. Modi did not. He did speak in Hindi of the privations of his childhood and teared up a little. Joining me now from Washington, D.C. is Mukesh Aghi. He's president of the U.S. India Business Council. Mr. Aghi, thank you. You were there this weekend in Silicon Valley. What is in this visit? for Narendra Modi. What is he getting out of it? Well, you have to look at uh, from a uh, government of India perspective, it exports roughly the trade between India and U.S. is around $100 billion. Slightly over $60 billion is in IT services. And when you look at uh, his objective of creating digital India, uh, he's looking at the Silicon Valley from a technology perspective. Uh, he's looking at from an investment perspective. And more important, when you look at 15% of the startups in Silicon Valley are done by Indians, he's looking at these entrepreneurs to come in and bring the same environment into India itself. So there are multiple reasons for him to go visit the Silicon Valley. Step one uh, in rolling out a digital India is going to be putting the necessary infrastructure in place. Uh, you know, if you look right now, 85% uh, I believe of the people in India do not have access to uh, to the internet. Um, how can Silicon Valley help him do that, roll out very expensive infrastructure? Well, I, I guess, uh, you know, 85 percent of the population does not have access to the internet. But when you look at where it was three years ago, where it is now, uh, India has moved from roughly 100 million plus internet users to 300 million in the last three years. So I think there is a exponential growth taking place among the user base. The challenge is, is trying to come up with a technology which does not look at the old uh, form of uh, delivery of broadband uh, to 660,000 villages in India itself. I think we have to be creative and we have to look at some other alternative way to reach out to the villages. I think it's a challenge. It requires a lot of investment, a lot of new technologies, and that's what uh, Modi is looking for. The U.S. is going through the same challenge right now. Somebody has to pay for a rollout. It's either the government, it's, pri it's, uh, it's private companies, uh, or it's Silicon Valley in the U.S. Of course, Google is rolling out fiber to many, con to many uh, cities here. What is the right mix of those three, foreign investment, domestic telecoms, and government expense? Well, I guess government does not have the money. Uh, let's be very honest about that. Uh, we have to have some kind of a model which is basically a public-private partnership, which does give right ROI to the investors. And I think government has to be creative to bring in Silicon Valley investors to come into India and make sure that they're able to generate fair profit and at the same time deliver broadband to the rest of the country. What structure has to be in place in India? Right now, uh, India's foreign direct investment is at $34 million from the U.S. Excuse me, I think that's billion. Um, billion. What, what has to happen uh, for that to increase? Um, other than the in Internet infrastructure that we've been talking about, uh, what else uh, does uh, Narendra Modi have to put in place? Well, I guess one of the most uh, uh, important thing which has to come into play is transparency and predictability in policy making. Unless you are able to deliver that to the investors, to the boardroom, uh, companies, individuals, organizations 
will not come in and invest. That's one. The second is, is ease of doing business. India is ranked 142 out of 189 economies surveyed by the World Bank. I think India has to go up that value chain and make it easy for people to invest in India, easy to get permits to build hotels or build factories. Unless that changes, I think it will be tough to get investment into the country. So this is when we talk about Silicon Valley direct investment, uh, a lot of the challenges are the exact same as any other plain old boring industrial investment. I would say uh, yes and no also. When I say no, what we are seeing is, especially in e-commerce, uh, we are seeing a lot of Silicon Valley investment coming from private equities into companies like Flipkart, Ola, all these e-commerce e uh, companies leveraging technology to provide uh, services either on the, uh, on the shopping side or on the taxi services or on delivery side. I think that seems to be moving on its own. Where we need to look at investment coming is more in the large infrastructure, which is not the Silicon Valley, but I think the ease of doing business does have impact on Silicon Valley also. Where you are in Washington, D.C., uh, it seems like Indian businesses, uh, or, or rather the, the most important uh, uh, lobbying goal for Silicon Valley is getting the right visas in place. How important is that for India, or is that just a Silicon Valley goal? Well, I think it is uh, as important for India as it is for Silicon Valley, because uh, today the H-1B visa does have impact on Indian companies who would like to send in more resources, uh, helping U.S. companies become much more cost-effective and compete globally. And I think today the limit does have an impact. And so what happens is a lot of these services are done uh, from India, which can be done here. So I think both India, uh, Indian companies, and Silicon Valley are focused on trying to increase the H-1B uh, visa issue. Let me ask, uh, you know, I, I wanted to play this quote for you, but we're running out of time. Yesterday I talked to uh, Arundhati uh, Bhattacharya, the head of the State Bank of India, and she said basically as they're trying to roll out uh, access, uh, uh, banking access uh, to India, the actual physical infrastructure uh, of a bank is just as important as the digital infrastructure. As India is making investment choices, how does it get that right between rolling out physical things, both for Internet access and banks, and uh, the digital access that is equally important? Well, if you look at the uh, last six months, this government has been able to open 180 million bank accounts for Indian citizens. That is without any physical banking infrastructure, more focus on digital infrastructure. Uh, I think my, my recommendation would be is, is in the new model, physical infrastructure buildings for banks are not as critical as digital connectivity because you can still do banking from your mobile phone rather than walk into a bank itself. Okay, Dr. Mugesh Aghi of the U.S. India Business Council, thank you very much. Of course, uh, Narendra Modi uh, visiting Silicon Valley, having a, 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 a at times emotional meeting with Mark Zuckerberg, among other West Coast luminaries. Moving on, sadly, a truce has been declared in a fight between two heavyweights from Hollywood and Silicon Valley. It began when Apple CEO Tim Cook appeared on Stephen Colbert's show last week and was asked what he thought of the new Steve Jobs movie. He was a joy to work with, uh, and I love him dearly. I miss him every day. Uh, I think that a lot of people are trying to uh, be opportunistic, and I, I hate this. It's a, not a great part of our, mm -hmm. of our world. Aaron Sorkin is the guy who wrote the Jobs movie. He also wrote the Zuckerberg movie. That is kind of his thing. He told The Hollywood Reporter that, quote, if you've got a factory full of children in China assembling phones for 17 cents an hour, you've got a lot of nerve calling someone else opportunistic. That is the guy who wrote A Few Good Men. Truth that Tim Cook couldn't handle. Over the weekend, Sorkin apologized, saying both he and Cook went too far. Apple had no comment. That's Apple's thing. Apple says it sold a record number of iPhones over the weekend, all thanks to China. But is the Chinese market getting oversaturated? Plus, big news from 140 million miles away. NASA says there may be liquid water on Mars. Details next.
Welcome back to Bloomberg West. I'm Brendan Greeley in for Emily Chang. Apple is reporting record sales of its newest iPhones. More than 13 million of the iPhone 6S and 6S Plus were sold over the weekend. That compares to only 10 million sold during the debut of the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus last year. But here's the thing. This year, the numbers include sales in China. That is not the case for the initial re of the release of the last iPhone model. So the key question, how much did China contribute to Apple's sales numbers in its debut weekend? Joining us now to discuss is Adam Sotariano. He covers Apple for Bloomberg News. And from Boston is IDC's Vice President of Mobile Research, John Jackson. They both attended Apple's iPhone event earlier this month. So, Adam, let's start with you. Can you help me tease out these numbers? Apple said it was a record, but numbers always grow, don't they? What, what does a record mean? What did it consist of? Yeah, every year that uh, Apple's been releasing the iPhone, they've they've hit a new record. And this year, uh, they jumped to 13 million from 10. But you're right. Uh, this includes China, which analysts say is equal to as much as 3 million of that number. And so, in some ways, if you back out the China figure, the the numbers are about flat. And so, you did see Apple's uh, stock today, kind of as investors tease that out. The the company's stock did fall a bit. Uh, John Jackson uh, in, in, in Boston, uh, help us understand what the market looks like in China right now. There, 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 there are two different markets. There's a high-end and a low-end market. Um, is the low-end market oversaturated at this point? The low-end market may well be oversaturated. I think a couple of important figures to think about is if we look at Q2 of 2014, this is calendar year Q2, to Q2 of 2015, we saw the high-end market, that's $400 uh, U.S. selling price and above uh, in China, almost double from 8.8% of volumes to 16.4% of volumes. If you look really at where Apple plays in that market, that kind of $600 and above threshold, that market more than doubled, right? Went from 4.9% to 12.3% in that one-year span. The indication is that uh, the high end of the Chinese market is really almost all Apple. So, you know, they are killing it at the high end of the Chinese market, and they're expanding it. And let's not forget that this is a company that has been in the business of putting wind in its own sails for, uh, for quite some time now. So, you know, the low end of the market... Uh, is, uh, I would say, yes, oversaturated. You have a couple of rock stars down there, Zhao Mei being the most conspicuous of them of late. Uh, but I, I'm, you know, I, I, th I think it's pretty clear Apple doesn't really want to play there. Let's stick with the high end for a second. In China, uh, one of the things that we've seen, industrial numbers plummeting, uh, equity indexes plummeting, crackdown on luxury by the party. What does the future of the high end market look like in China? So I, I'm not sure there's a stop to it, to be honest. You know, I, if you uh, kind of look at these incremental numbers, we have, um, you know, Apple's numbers in China as a percentage of all iPhone shipments. And Adam, I think, is right on with this 3 million number. Uh, last three quarters, uh, Q3 last year, 13.4. Uh, percent of that market, growing to 17.8 percent of that market in Q4, uh, and then to 23.7 percent in Q1, to 24.6 percent in Q2. So Apple continues to grow this market. Uh, you know, regulations and economic headwinds be darned. Obviously, we'll see what happens in the coming quarter. Adam, should we think of Apple as just an iPhone company? I mean, it's, it's without a doubt its most important product. I mean, it is the center of their, of their universe, and a lot of the other stuff that they do kind of orbits around it at this point. It accounts for more than 60% of their revenue and an even bigger portion of their profits. And so everything is kind of centered around that. But that percentage of, of, of their business has been growing, and so they've been trying to offset that with some other areas. Uh, they introduced the Apple Watch, but that still hasn't really taken off. And the iPad sales have also been f falling, and so you're seeing iPhone take up a bigger and bigger piece of Apple's business. How important is the launch weekend? Is, 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 is a new iPhone a little bit like a Hollywood movie? Do we watch the launch weekend to see what it's going to make overall? It's an important metric, but it's not the most important one. Uh, as, you, as we were talking about, these figures were somewhat uh, skewed because of the introduction of China. What will be a better barometer of how the device is selling will come in January when Apple releases the figures for how they did in the holiday quarter. Uh, the company has been really concentrating uh, its releases around the last three months of the year. And so how they do in the end of the year will really be the best metric of, of how the company is doing for the, for the period. Um, 
John, what is the next likely growth market for Apple? We've been saying for a while that Apple's really a China play, but is it an emerging markets play? Where does it go next? Well, you just had Dr. Agi on, and uh, he was describing, I think, what's pretty clear to everybody is that you know there's, there's, there are volume opportunities, if you're an optimist, that continue to hide in plain sight uh, in these emerging markets. So just to give you some perspective, in 2014, uh, China was 10x, right? China's volumes were, were 10x the next largest emerging market, which wasn't even India, by the way. It was Russia, and then it was Brazil. And so India is kind of this distant fourth. So again, if you're optimistically inclined. You know, there's a lot of upside left to be mined out of these markets, but as Adam said, uh, you know, I think Apple understands very well that it has this dependency right now, and so there's an imperative to do for the home, for the car, for the wrist, for the wallet, what it's done for the iPhone. Okay, Bloomberg's Adam Satariano, IDC's Vice President of Mobile Research, John Jackson. What we learned is that Apple is not a China play, it's a brick play. Thank you both very much. Today, an update from space. NASA scientists say they've discovered strong evidence of liquid water on Mars. That is a precursor to any hope of finding extraterrestrial life on Mars. Infrared images show long, dark stains on the Martian terrain that reach hundreds of meters long in warmer months, but dry up in autumn as the surface cools because science is awesome. Scientists already knew that Mars has frozen water at its poles, but this is the first concrete evidence of water in liquid form. NASA says the only definitive way to determine whether there's life on Mars for now is to collect rocks and soil for analysis on Earth. That is something a U.S. lander is set to do in 2020. Coming up, how on-demand education is shaping productivity in the labor market, Udemy. CEO joins us to explain next and more talking, less texting. An MIT professor explains the downside of our device-dominated world. Time for the bite. One number that tells a bigger story. Today, the number is 89. That is a percentage of people who say they used their cell phones at the last social gathering they attended. This according to a recent Pew Research poll. That stat was highlighted in a New York Times op-ed by MIT professor Sherry Turkle over the weekend. Turkle believes that face-to-face -face conversation is a dying art, particularly for college students in our increasingly cyber-connected world. She points to a 2010 study by the University of Michigan that showed a 44% percent decline in empathy among college students most of the drop coming after the year 2000. Turkle says the best way to counter an ever more socially awkward world is to focus more on personal relationships and less on cell phones and other devices. You would think that would be easy in college. Now, the on-demand economy meets education. Udemy is an online education marketplace that is meant to close the skills gap in the workforce, perhaps in a more efficient way than traditional higher education can. For example, from the rollout of Apple's iOS 8 to 9, Udemy saw student interest in relevant web development courses surge from 2,000 to 20,000. Joining us now from San Francisco, the company's CEO, Dennis Yang. Dennis, I'm fascinated by your model. I just poked around a little bit and discovered um, that I can learn how to, uh, how, how, how to cook uh, Thai food uh, on Udemy, which is something that I've been wanting to do, which is exciting for me. Uh, but I want to understand what is the distinction between learning something and becoming certified in something? How important is the certification in the workforce? Sure, so uh, that's a great question. Uh, it really depends on what the intent of the actual student is. So what we find as an example is we have plenty of students who, who are coming in to learn at Udemy and they want to learn a very specific skill set and they want to come in, get a bite-sized uh, chunk of knowledge and then leave and they're not actually only interested in the signaling itself. Rather, they're interested in learning and developing the skill itself, uh, and they find that uh, useful as is. There are definitely other people, though, within Udemy who have used their experience on Udemy as uh, currency uh, as a signal to help them get in new jobs and roles. So it's really two different markets depending on what the students' uh, goals are. Are employers coming along with you? I mean, is, is it appropriate to say, well, I just know this skill, I learned it on Udemy, or do you need some sort of academy certification? No, you don't. And what we find is that at the end of the day, today in the market, you can see that it's so much easier to assess whether or not somebody actually has the skills to be competent and to be ready for a particular role instead of just, just only having that signal. So uh, within the enterprise and within businesses, we've got companies such as Citigroup from the large end down to Lyft on the smaller end, all using Udemy to help train their employees. 
One of the things that has been poking, showing up in my uh, Facebook feed recently is constant offers from Johns Hopkins, from Stanford, from MIT to learn uh, data management, to get a certificate in data management. Sure. How do you yeah. compete with accredited organizations, the ability to take Johns Hopkins or Stanford and in any way put it anywhere on my resume? Sure, absolutely. So look, at the end of the day, uh, there are certainly a class of experts that come from traditional academia. We don't focus on working only with university partners. Our, our model is an open marketplace model. So instead, we open it up to a community of experts because we don't actually believe that it's possible to decide and determine what it is that people want to learn in the future. So we open it up to our community of experts to dictate what it is, uh, which direction that people want to go in. Uh, and so certainly one way is to work with the university partners. Another is to work with the everyday experts that are actually working in these fields. What can primary and secondary schools learn from this? <laughs> well, look, uh, let's face it. So traditional education is, was built in uh, from a time that was a long time ago. And there's obviously been a lot of changes in the world around us, especially in the world of work. So as a result, you've got this gap between uh, what uh, traditional, where traditional academia leaves off and what uh, is happening in the rest of the world. So we do feel like there's just a little bit of a skills gap. So that's one piece. The second piece is how people consume content in media today is obviously very different. So structuring education around a traditional learning experience within a classroom where people obviously on their devices, uh, it's, it's, there's certainly a mismatch in terms of uh, people's expectations of how they engage content outside of the school and uh, within schools. Dennis, we're running out of time. I'm going to give you about 10 seconds. I'm really curious, sure. what's the difference between what people outside the U.S. want to learn on your site and what people inside the U.S. want to learn? Yeah, no, absolutely. So today, we're still seeing a lot of similarities. It's really the early adopters around technology, business, and professional skills. But let's be clear, there are a lot of nuances in terms of what, how, what it is that people want to learn and from whom. So how you learn leadership, as an example, in Germany may be different from within the U.S. Okay, Dennis Yang, he's the CEO of Udemy. Thank you. His site is going to Thanks, teach Brendan. me how to cook Thai food, and that is going to make the entire Greeley family happy. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg West. Tomorrow on the show, all the details from Google's Nexus launch event. We will see you then.